Good afternoon. afternoon. The images from the honorable carry ceremony at Joint Base Pearl Harbor this month made us all proud to be Americans. President Trump is committed to getting the almost 8,000 left behind from the Korean War home and bringing closure to the families who have been waiting for more than 60 years. The process of identifying and verifying the remains is challenging, but one that this administration is committed to. Overseeing this process is Kelly McKegg, the Director of Defense for POW and MIA Accounting Agency, leading DOD's worldwide operation of research, investigation, recovery, and identification, and supporting functions. Director McKegg strives to provide the fullest possible accounting of our missing personnel. The director, along with his colleagues, Dr. John Bird, the Defense POW and MIA Accounting Agency Laboratory Director, and Dr. Timothy McMahon, Director of DOD DNA Operations, have joined us today to offer remarks and take your questions on this topic. After this, I'll be back up to address other questions and news of the day. Thanks, Director. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The August 1st repatriation and homecoming in Hawaii of the remains of the Korean War unaccounted for was a poignant manifestation of the commitment secured by President Trump and pledged by Chairman Kim at the Singapore summit. For the families of the 7,700 still unaccounted for from the Korean War, this first step in fulfilling this commitment has undoubtedly provided a seed of hope. Last week, over 700 of these family members gathered in Arlington, Virginia to receive government updates and they were resoundingly appreciative of the successful advocacy of the president and his administration. Two of those family members who attended, Charles and Larry McDaniel, were the recipients of the dog tag their father, Master Sergeant Charles McDaniel of Indiana. It was a sole personal effect returned by the North Koreans. The remains of those 55 cases are well into the painstaking multifaceted analyses by Dr. John Bird and his forensic science team in Hawaii. And in the coming weeks, Dr. Tim McMahon and his dedicated DNA specialists in Delaware will begin their meticulous testing. The metal of our scientists and the capabilities of our labs will be challenged. But in the months and years ahead, they will make identifications from these remains and give families long sought answers. We are guardedly optimistic the one August Repatriation is the first tangible action of others which with, with which we will be able to account for more of our missing from the Korean War. The second aspect of the, Korean, of the Singapore commitment was the recovery of remains in North Korea, which DPRK officials reaffirmed last month. We are in the midst of exploring next steps as well as discussions with the Korean People's Army for the express purpose of resuming joint field operations and having additional repatriations. But our mission to search for, find, and account for missing Department of Defense personnel from World War II through Operation Iraqi Freedom is one not limited to the Korean Peninsula. Today, 186 personnel from DPA and private partners are deployed in seven nations, and yesterday, 50 of those members returned from Laos and the Philippines. Our global mission is humanitarian in every respect because the impact of a missing American to their family is not constrained by time or generations, and it leaves an enduring pain and void. This is why former enemies like Vietnam use cooperation on the POW MIA mission as a bridge to normalization and today's thriving bilateral relationship with the United States. The fact that the United States of America vigorously pursues the fullest possible accounting of our missing reflects our values as a nation. The sacred obligation, if not moral imperative, remains a high priority for the Department of Defense. Inherent to the exceptional teamwork, resources, and resoluteness provided by multiple agencies is a solemn vow that those who were sent off in harm's way and are missing will not be forgotten and their families will receive answers to their decades of uncertainty. My colleagues and I welcome your questions. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I was with President Clinton in 2000 when he went to a place in Vietnam, north of Hanoi, where one of these recovery efforts were under, underway. So I have some familiarity with this. Even there, when things are discovered, 
it takes a long time to establish the trail forensically. I'd like to ask you both, what condition are the remains or the parts of remains you've received so far and how challenging will the forensic work be ahead? Are you a long, long way or was what you received something that gets you close to identifying and confirming? We, we would characterize the preservation of the remains as moderate to poor. Uh, as a general consideration. However, uh, what our lab specializes in is making identifications in circumstances where you have very little to work with. And so I, I'm confident that we're going to do well uh, with the remains in these 55 boxes over the coming months and, and maybe the next several years. Uh, when you look at what's at stake, um, we're going to be doing a lot of DNA sampling. Uh, and that's what Dr. McMahon's lab does, is they process the samples and then they go into a mass database uh, where they can be compared to all of the other samples that we've generated from remains from North Korea and also compared to the family members. And so it takes some time to get the samples processed through uh, the lab at AFMES. It takes some time to get them into the mass comparison, but once they're in there, uh, we'll start looking for the, the quick uh, identifications that can be made where you have compelling matches that show themselves early on. Uh, we also look for uh, comparisons to dental records that can be distinctive. Uh, we look for un individuals that are unusual in the sense of being very tall, very short, very old. Anything that distinguishes somebody, we can usually get a good clue and identify them faster. Uh, but uh, because of the preservation of the remains, that will just sort of guide the kinds of methods that we can bring to bear on the case. And, and the case will be very DNA or be very DNA intensive in terms of the way that we're going to go about this. And to the number 55, is that... What does that number represent? And, and is the that 55 individuals? No, it's the number of boxes that the remains came in. And, uh, at no time did, did we expect there to be one body, one box, uh, nor did the North Koreans try to pitch it that way to us when we were in Wonsan. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Director, uh, thank you. What type of uh, certainty do you have that the remains that the North Koreans have handed over uh, to the Americans are that of missing Americans as opposed to other nationalities that fought alongside the Americans during the Korean War? We have a high confidence. So in the early 90s, for five years, the North Koreans would repatriate unilaterally remains that they had recovered. Out of those 208 boxes over those five years, we estimated, after DNA sampling, 400 individuals. Now from that, 200 were Americans. So the likelihood is, you're correct, there may be some of UN sending forces, there may be some South Korean soldiers' remains, as well as Chinese and North Korean. But our laboratories, both DNA and the forensic laboratory, have the technology and the capabilities by which to differentiate those remains over the course of the next several years. Director, um, I think you mentioned you're in some discussions with the North Koreans about potential future actions, maybe to search for more remains and joint efforts as such. I think the Pentagon and, and Secretary Mattis has mentioned that. Um, what, if, I find, if I'm to understand right, the Bush administration ended the program in which uh, U.S. officials would be helping search for the remains, in part because of security concerns for our own um, uh, forces there. Um, can you describe kind of what you're looking for from the North uh, that could resume those kind of operation, joint operations, and you know what steps you needed, how close you are to maybe, maybe doing that? So for 10 years, we operated between 1996 and 2005. Over time, collect, conducting 33 joint activities with the North Koreans. Security is primary, primarily our responsibility for our personnel. We also pay attention to communications, having communications abilities, as well as having an ability to medevac our personnel should they get hurt. What we would be looking for from the North Koreans is, again, a commitment from them that communications, medical evacuation requirements can be met, and more importantly, that we can conduct these joint operations in a collaborative way, as we had done for 10 years. It all comes down back in the 2005 to their behavior on the international stage. Uh, the president, rightfully so, was concerned that their nuclear activities, their missile activities were countermanding and counterproductive to our joint operations, which is why we suspended. It's more the tone and the bigger geopolitical 
talks that are going on, or is it specifics about being in the field that you're really looking at right now? Both. So Secretary Pompeo, in getting a reaffirmation from the North Koreans last month, affirmed that they do want to establish communications with us and to conduct joint operations. We have not started those negotiations. We will do so. It is on a separate track. However, as you well pointed out, it could be drawn into the greater geopolitical stream. But for now, we're treating it as a military-to-military -military contact, but more importantly, as a humanitarian endeavor that's separate and distinct from anything else. And by the way, the 45 countries that we work with all rightfully recognize this as a humanitarian endeavor, including countries like Russia and China, where we have tremendous cooperation with them. John. Thank you, Sarah. Gentlemen, um, the recent death of former Congressman Bill Hendon of North Carolina brought back a lot of the rehashing of serious charges he made that uh, those who were in Vietnam, either as prisoners or dead, were not fully accounted for. Uh, has the book finally been closed on those Americans who served in Vietnam? and we're prisoners of war. It has. So right now there are close to 1,700, 1,600, that are remain missing and unaccounted for. Within that set of unaccounted for is what we call last known alive. It's a small subset of individuals who, for whatever reason, were seen alive at a certain point during the war and were remained unaccounted for. Our priority with the Vietnamese is to get at that subset, small subset. I think it's down to 25, not necessarily prisoners of war, but again, last known alive at the time that they were seen. I'll take one last question, Brian. Uh, real quick, um, of the remains in the 55 boxes, can we confirm for a fact that all of them are human remains, or are we still questioning that? Uh, yes. we. We did a, uh, a cursory inspection of the remains in Wonsan before we loaded them onto our, our military aircraft just to ensure that at least some of what was in each box was human. When we got to Osan in South Korea, we spent two days going through every box in detail conducting what we call a field forensic review. Purpose of that review is to ensure that every item is consistent with being human, and if there were any animal remains, we would have culled them out at that point. As it was, we did not find any animal remains. Do we have any idea how many people that we're looking at yet? No, we don't. Uh, you know, there is a, a scientific process to estimate that, uh, and I wish it were very fast because I think a lot of people would really like to know. The families would love to know that information, but unfortunately it's going to take uh, months of analysis to start to get a refined estimate. Thank you. Sorry, just one last question. Sarah, thank you. Um, do you have a timeline for bringing back more remains, and can you characterize what it has been like to work with the North Koreans on this particular part of this process? Have they been working with you in good faith at every step of the way? Okay, so the, the first question is, as Mr. McKegg mentioned, we're in the process of planning uh, next steps, so we can't say we have any timeline today for bringing back more remains. We're hopeful that we will be uh, in the not too distant future. I will say, though, in terms of, of having worked there, I worked there in the past uh, during the 1996 to 2005 years. I spent a lot of time in the field there. Uh, and then I went into Wonsan uh, with our team on July 27th, uh, and there was a very different feel to it this time. Uh, it was a, a much more uh, uh, friendly, uh, welcoming, and collegial approach this time compared to the way it used to be. Thank you, Director. Looking ahead to next week, Ambassador Bolton will meet with officials in Israel and Ukraine as well as with his Russian counterpart in Geneva as a follow-up to the Helsinki summit to discuss a range of important national security issues. Lastly, we extend our prayers to the families of those injured and deceased after the tragic bridge collapse in Genoa, Italy, as well as to the victims of this morning's attack in London. 
The President condemns this horrible attack on innocent civilians and stands ready to provide assistance to the United Kingdom. And with that, I'll take your questions. Jonathan. Uh, sir, we, we've heard from the President uh, via Twitter on Omarosa describing her as crazed, a crying lowlife, a dog. Is this any way for a President to talk about any American, let alone somebody that he hired and made the highest ranking African-American woman that served in his White House? Uh, I think the President is certainly voicing his frustration uh, with the fact that this person has shown a complete lack of integrity, particularly by the actions following her time here at the White House. But why did he hire her? I mean, why didn't he hire somebody he's describing as a dog, as a Look, The President woman. wanted uh, to give her a chance, and he uh, made clear when General Kelly came on, and he voiced concerns uh, that this individual what didn't have the best interest of the White House and the President and the country at heart. Uh, the president said, do what you can to get along, and if you can't, uh, he gave him full authority to carry out the decision to let her go. Steve? What is his strategy in continuing to respond to the charges in this book? Why does he just ignore it? Uh, look, I think he's made, again, uh, the frustrations. I, I, I think all, not only those of us here in the White House, but frankly, I think most of America would be happy to ignore it. Unfortunately, the individuals in this room continue to create a large platform for somebody they know not to have a lot of credibility, for someone they, frankly, refused to give a, a platform to when they worked here at the White House. Uh, it wasn't until this individual started to negatively attack this president and this administration uh, and try to tear this uh, entire place down that she received the type of platform and rollout that she's getting. I think it would be great if every single person in this room uh, and every single person in the administration never had to talk about this again. And we actually got to focus on the real policies and the real things that not matter just to uh, people in this building, but certainly all Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and everybody in between. I think that would be the best thing that we could certainly do for our country. Jill. What do you say to critics who see his attacks on Omarosa as part of a pattern of insulting prominent African Americans, people he's taken, uh, criticized recently include Don Lemon, Maxine Waters, he's claimed that football players protesting racial injustice don't know what they're protesting? Uh, look, the, the President, this has uh, absolutely nothing to do with race and everything to do uh, with the President uh, calling out someone's lack of integrity. Uh, the idea that you would only point a few of the uh, things that the President has said negative uh, about people that are minorities, the fact is the President's um, an equal opportunity uh, person that calls things like he sees it. He always fights fire with fire, and he certainly doesn't hold back on doing that across the board. Have you signed an NDA? Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, the back and forth on who has signed an NDA here at the White House. I can tell you that it's common in a lot of places for employees to sign NDAs, in including government? in government, particularly anyone with a security clearance. Yeah, Annie? Yeah. Sorry. Um, Unless there's uh, another the, Annie back there, the I don't know. <laughs> John may ha be happy to go by Annie if that means he gets to take your question. but. Uh, the President said he kept Omarosa on despite complaints from her colleagues because she was personally supportive of him and said nice Sorry, things about him. Sorry, I can't hear you. Him. He said he kept her on despite complaints about her behavior because she was personally supportive of him and said nice things about him. Is that true of any other <laughs> officials that are working in this White House right now? Uh, I'm not aware of that. Justin? Um, since you don't want to talk about Omarosa, I have a bunch on Turkey that hopefully you'll let me get through. A um, bunch? I don't know. We'll do our best. Uh, do you have a reaction to President Erdogan calling for a ban on U.S. electronics like iPhones, and would the President encourage a similar ban uh, on Turkish products by uh, Americans? I certainly don't have a uh, policy announcement on that front at this point. In sort of the same vein, there was a report from our colleague at Reuters that the U.S. is warning Turkey of uh, increased pressure, so I'm wondering if you have details on how that was conveyed, what uh, additional steps might look like, and if the U.S. would take additional steps before the hearing for the detained American pastor on October 12th. How the information from Turkey was received or how the information from the United States to Turkey? Uh, we can tell you that uh, at the Turkish ambassador's request, as you know, Ambassador John Bolton uh, met with the ambassador of Turkey yesterday here at the White House and continued to raise uh, and point out the concerns that we have. One last one. Um, did the President encourage Israel's government to uh, Released a Turkish citizen in July, and did that contribute to his frustration with 
Erdogan not releasing this American pastor? Uh, certainly the president has a great deal of frustration uh, on the fact that Pastor Brunson has not been released, as well as uh, the fact that other U.S. citizens and employees of diplomatic facilities have not been released. And we're going to continue to call on Turkey to do the right thing and release those individuals. Sager. Thanks, Sarah. Does the, pre does the president or this White House believe that it is a violation of Department of Justice protocol if the special counsel's investigation goes beyond September 1st? Uh, I'm not going to say that we would say necessarily a specific violation, but I think we've been very clear that uh, not only do we, but all of the American people want this to wrap up. John? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, two questions on Turkey. Uh, as the relationship between the president and President Erdogan grows peripherous, uh, my question very simply is, are we going to see the restoration of the readouts on calls between the president and other world leaders. That was terminated on the day after President Erdogan's election, and although we know that he, our, the president made a congratulatory call to him, there has been no readout since. Is that going to be restored? Certainly, we'll continue to keep you all posted, uh, not just on calls with Turkey, but other head of state calls as well, uh, and provide readouts when we have them. Dave. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan this week has been on a surprise offensive. They've killed um, about 100 Afghan security forces, a couple dozen civilians, as far as we know. Um, the president was visiting with the 10th, 10th Mountain Division yesterday at Fort Drum. They've served in Afghanistan. Does this new offensive, um, is he still committed to uh, his strategy that he outlined a year ago for Afghanistan, or does this new offensive give him the idea that maybe a different approach might be needed? Uh, certainly no announcements or changes in policy from the President's rollout last August. Kristen. Sarah, have you asked the President if he's ever used the N-word? Uh, the President uh, addressed that question directly via Twitter. I'd refer you back to him. I can certainly say I've never heard him use uh, that term or anything but, but similar. Have you, have you asked him directly, Sarah? Uh, the President, I didn't have to because he addressed it to the American people all at one time. Why have you asked him directly? Uh, again, the President answered that question directly uh, on Twitter earlier today. Can you stand at the podium and guarantee the American people they'll never hear Donald Trump utter the N-word on a recording in any context? Uh, I can't guarantee uh, anything, but I can tell you that the President addressed this question directly. I can tell you that I've never heard it. Uh, I can also tell you that if myself or the people that are in this building serving this country every single day, doing our very best to help people uh, all across this country and make it better, if at any point we felt uh, that the President was who some of his critics claim him to be, we certainly wouldn't be here. This is a President who uh, is fighting for all Americans who is putting policies in place that help all Americans, particularly African Americans. Uh, just look at the economy alone. This president, since he took office in the year and a half that he's been here, has created 700,000 new jobs for African Americans. That's 700,000 African Americans that are working now that weren't working when this president took place. When President Obama left after eight years in office, eight years in office, he had only created 800 or 195,000 jobs for African Americans. President Trump, in his first year and a half, has already tripled what President Obama did in eight years. Not only did he do that for African Americans, but for Hispanics. 1.7 million more Hispanics are working now. This is a president who cares about all Americans, who is committed to helping them, and is putting policies in place that actually do that. Kevin. Sorry, Kristen. I'm going to go ahead to Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Go ahead. Just to be clear, you can't guarantee it. I, look, I haven't been in every single room. I can tell you the President has addressed this directly. Uh, he's addressed it directly to the American people, and I can tell you what the focus and the heart of the President is, and that's on helping all Americans. Uh, and certainly, uh, this is somebody who has been in business uh, for decades, and you're just now hearing some of these outrageous accusations after the fact he's dealt with people all over the world. It wasn't until he became a candidate for President that you started to hear some of these salacious uh, and 
ridiculous claims. And certainly, I think if you look at uh, the actions that this president has taken, certainly the policies that he's enacted, you can see the heart of who he is, and you can see exactly uh, what he has done and the type of president and person he is. Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. Just a, a very quick one on something that Omarosa said today. She called the president uh, unfit, mentally unfit for the office. As someone who worked with her, how surprised are you at the uh, the level of uh, her animus toward this president and toward this White House? And if I could follow. Uh, I'm certainly, I think, like most people that worked with her, very disappointed uh, that she would go to such a self-serving uh, and somebody who blatantly cares more about herself than our country uh, to make up some of these outrageous claims and accusations. Uh, Look, she worked here for a year and didn't have any of these things to say. In fact, uh, everything she said was quite the opposite, and not just the year that she worked here, uh, but the time that she spent on the campaign trail. And I think it's really sad what she's doing at this if point. I could follow very quickly, I wanted to ask you uh, just very briefly. We read earlier this afternoon that the Trump campaign has made uh, an arbitration action against Omarosa. And I'm just curious, and I know they're separate entities, but is it likely that the White House is considering pursuing something in the way of uh, possible action toward Omarosa for violating any I certainly wouldn't be able to comment on any uh, potential ongoing legal matter. Major. Sir, a moment ago you said one of the motives for Omarosa was to tear this entire place down. What do you mean by that? And do you have, or others here, have ongoing concerns that while she was here, she taped other conversations that could either be damaging to the reputation of this White House or relevatory is something you'd rather keep private? I, I think the greatest concern we have is the lack of integrity that this individual has shown. One, thing, one other thing, Sarah, she played a tape recording of a conversation with the President. Do you have any doubt that that is an authentic conversation that she had with the President? Uh, I don't. Okay, then related to that, the President said he was unaware in that conversation. Is that tr was that a truthful representation, representation of what he knew at the time, or was he just trying to make Omarosa feel better? Uh, as I said moments ago, the president had had a direct conversation with General Kelly, uh, asked them to try to work things out. If it didn't, he gave uh, General Kelly the full authority uh, to make decisions about hiring and firing, including with respect to Omarosa. Because he knew what would happen, and he knew he'd approved it. Uh, on the timing, I think is he knew that it was certainly a possibility, but as to the fact whether or not General Kelly had called the president, I don't think he had at that point. Uh, Steve? Yes, Sarah, repeatedly we've heard the president declare that the, the so-called Islamic State terror group has been practically vanquished, uh, especially in Iraq and Syria. Well, the Defense Department yesterday, the lead inspector general for Operation Inherent Resolve, in fact, says that uh, their forces are estimated to be anywhere between 28,600 and 31,600 fighters, which would be about the number that they had at their peak. So has ISIS been practically vanquished? Certainly we know that the caliphate has uh, been practically destroyed. Certainly there are uh, continue to be ISIS fighters, and that's why we continue to take uh, all of those threats seriously and look for ways every single day to defeat them and protect uh, American people and our allies. Mike? Can I go back to the race question again? Uh, I get that, that, that you can cite things, statistics that might be positive statistics for policies the President has done vis-a-vis -vis African Americans and other minorities. What do you say to people who look at the pattern of comments that the President has made specifically about African Americans and feel like he is uh, uh, singling those folks out because of their race? Are they, are they missing something? Are they deluding themselves? What, what do you say to them? Because there are lots of people out there who look at the pattern and say, yes, he's, he says negative things about a lot of people, but there seems to be a particular pattern of, of singling out African Americans and commenting in particular about their, their intelligence or lack thereof and their looks. Uh, I certainly don't think so. I think, as I said, the, the president has said uh, similar things about a number of individuals, certainly, uh, that are not African American or any other minority. Um, 
I can simply talk to you about the policies and the person that the president is. I think if, again, the person that a lot of his critics say he is uh, certainly wouldn't have been in business with him for decades. Certainly you wouldn't have had Bill and Hillary Clinton. They attended his wedding. A number of Democrats begged him for campaign contributions. I mean, if they were who he said he was, why did they have these relationships with him? I think it is uh, very convenient that these accusations started once the president became uh, someone running for office. He has shown time and time again through his actions, through his policies, that he wants to be a president for all Americans, that he wants to do everything he can to make America better, and not just for a certain group of people, but for everybody. Um, I, I think that he has made a number of comments about uh, plenty of, of people, and to try to single that out to one group is frankly silly, because I think if you did a comparison, he's probably got a lot more uh, nasty things out there about some other people. I'm sorry? Do you think that, I mean, Look, the president is somebody who's always going to fight fire with fire. Uh, this is something that isn't new, and it's something the American people knew when they voted for him, and they overwhelmingly elected him to be the president of the United States. And since he took office, he has governed in a way that is helping all Americans. Frankly, if we want to look at who's creating divisions in the country, I think the media has done more to divide this country, certainly far more than this president ever has, by elevating uh, people like the author of this book, by I have focusing on uh, a sparsely attended rally instead of all of the policies that this administration and that this president are enacting that are helping people not just on the economy but on school choice, on prison reform that's disproportionately affected African Americans and Hispanics. This is a president who is governing to help all Americans and I think we'd all be better off if the media gave that just a little bit more attention. John. Thanks a lot, Sarah. You expressed how you feel about Amoroso uh, since the publication of this book. How was she viewed um, by fellow staff members here at the White House while she worked here? Uh, was she, did she pull her own weight? Uh, was she viewed as untrustworthy? Uh, did you trust her? Um, I'm just get, trying to get a, a sense about whether your view of her has changed with the publication of this book. Uh, certainly, I've, I've uh, expressed some disappointment. I'm not going to get into a back and forth on personal feelings that I have with a former colleague. I think that uh, the focus not only of my time here but of this administration is looking forward and how we can actually uh, imp implement policies that matter to the American people, not who like to in the building behind me. Yeah, Ryan. Uh, a uh, different topic. We can. When, um, and then a follow up. When uh, the first time the Mueller investigation um, indicted some Russians, this administration sanctioned those Russians. The 12 that were recently indicted, the 12 uh, Russian nationals, does this administration plan to also level sanctions against them? I don't have any announcements on that front right now. What, quick follow up. You said you would like. Uh, everyone to stop talking about this particular subject, including the administration. So are you saying you would like the president to stop tweeting about Omarosa? I think if the media continues to give it wall-to-wall -wall coverage, the administration uh, in some cases will be forced to respond. But I think it would be better off for all of us to uh, walk away and focus on some things so that matter. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. I want to ask a question about Secretary Max. He's in Brazil right now and visiting other countries in South America. And how much does uh, his trip has to do with uh, countering the growing presence of China in the region? Uh, certainly we have a lot of uh, shared values with uh, the countries that he's visiting. We would always like to be um, the priority partner for those countries, and we hope that those relationships will continue to develop and we'll keep you posted if he has any updates from the trip. Last question, uh, Stephen. Uh, bearing in mind that, that the Trump campaign's announcement that it's pursuing arbitration uh, of uh, Omarosa necessitates attention and, and, and a major national focus. Can we talk, and, and, and can I ask you once more about the practice of, of signing people to non-disclosure agreements? Because I, let me ask you what it says about the expressions of loyalty or lack thereof, the people who work behind that wall. Why do people need to be contractually obligated to forever after, in perpetuity, never say anything negative about the president, any member of his family, any product they should produce? Why is that necessary? Look, again, it's common in a lot of... 
protect the corporate interests? What, what's the particular Certainly, it's also, um, despite contrary uh, opinion, it's actually very normal, and every administration prior to the Trump administration has had NDAs particularly specific for anyone that had a security clearance. This White House is security certainly no longer. Sorry, keeping someone like Omarosa silent, because right now, what, what the Trump campaign is doing is he's forcing her, essentially, to uh, defend herself and potentially even pay damages. Why is that necessary? Uh, that's a question you would have to ask the Trump campaign. It's certainly uh, not a question that I could answer as somebody that's in an official government capacity. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.